we have dialogue from Joy Boy, heavily laden, mysterious, and lore rich name to figure out, and a classic One Piece action fighting sequence. And where do I begin? All right, we're discussing chapter 1119. And you know what? I'm gonna start with the lore and the mystery and the intrigue because that's probably one of the things I love most about One Piece, or at least equal to the straw hats. And there were some pretty good straw hats moments in this chapter as well, but I'm sure we'll get to that later. So the Iron Giant has a name and it's Emeth or Emmet. And I knew this name sounded familiar when I was first reading the chapter live, but I couldn't quite put my finger on why. And it wasn't until our post chapter research period that I realized that it's a name that's used in the last book of the Chronicles of Narnia series. And it's a series that I once read when I was in around year six, I don't know, in primary school. But I do remember quite enjoying that series. And for those of you who don't know, Narnia can be interpreted to be a metaphorical representation of Christianity or a lot of biblical stories. And the last book of the Narnia series, I think it's called The Last Battle, is a loose fictional interpretation of the end of the world and Jesus' second coming, the biblical book of Revelations and all of that. In The Last Battle, Emmeth is a character that's supposed to represent inclusivity. Aslan, the ruler of Aslan's kingdom, being the metaphorical representation of God or Jesus in the series, he forgives or he accepts all actions done by Emmet and done by all people who acted virtuously and in good faith, even if they were doing so under the name of a false god or a false king. So long as those good deeds were founded on noble motives, Aslan decreed that he would accept all of those deeds as if they were done under his own name. And now, the reason why I have taken you on this journey in unpacking the last battle is because it was really interesting for me to read because it reminded me of a question I was asked during the live stream. Basically, I was asked about my thoughts on whether Zunisha could be Lily, which is a question that I had never really thought about or considered before. As I was re-familiarizing myself with Emmett's purpose and story in Nanya, it led me to think about the possibility of Lily being the Iron Giant instead. So I know that the question I was asked was about Lily being Zunesha, but I guess understanding Emmett's purpose in Nanya, and then knowing Lily's history as being formerly part of the 20 kingdoms that opposed the ancient kingdom, in other words, Lily was once serving another kingdom or once once at least serving another purpose or will, one that would oppose Joy Boy's will. But then she somehow made her way into becoming somehow allied with Joy Boy and the ancient kingdom after all. Now I won't delve too far into this because uh, I mean, we don't know how much Oda actually knows about Nanya. And it was just a random thought that popped into my head because of the question that I was asked earlier during the stream. But I guess if we go back to the origins of what Emmett actually actually means, being originally a Hebrew word with very heavy Jewish and biblical implications. The word emet means true or truth or faith or faithfulness, stability, reliability, etc, etc. And I say etc because it seems like depending on the context and how or where it's being used, the word emet can serve different purposes. In the Bible and I guess in the Torah, the way that the word is used in different sentences can mean different things. Sometimes truth, sometimes faithfulness, sometimes stability, you know, certainty. And I think that's interesting for us because I think that opens us up to so many possibilities on the Iron Giant or the Emmet's purpose in One Piece. In the Jewish religion, Emmet is also significantly linked to this almost mythological creature of the Golem. The Golem not being the Golem in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings series, but an inanimate, non- not quite human being, a being or a creature that comes to life after it's being activated by the use of the word Emmet. So it essentially seems like a clay or a mud figure that comes to life if one says, Emmet, that which then breathes life into that being. So then knowing the connections between Emmet and Golem, this then I think leads you to wonder, is the Iron Giant's name simply a play on the idea of being activated in the same way that the Iron Giant's been activated in One Piece, and then his name being a symbol of faithfulness and trust and reliability, 
which seems to fit the idea of the Iron Giant being a creature that has a sturdy creature that has also stayed true to Joy Boy's words and waited for almost a millennia, being faithful to the will of the ancient kingdom and of Joy Boy. Or, on the other hand, is the Iron Giant not a robot at all? And is the Iron Giant supposedly a red herring or a cloak to hide some other golem-like creature within? And again, I am just spitballing and thinking out loud here because I do personally think that the name will have more metaphorical significance than, than the Iron Giant actually hiding another creature within entirely. I mean, it's already lived up to its name in some way in the sense that it's been used as a vehicle for Vegapunk to impart the truth or the true message of history to the rest of the world. And in that sense, Emmett has been used for the fulfillment of truth. And I guess Vegapunk was also inside the Iron Giant when we first met Vegapunk and it didn't seem like he found another creature hiding inside the robot. But like I said, it's such a meaningful name with so many different possibilities and that leads to and breeds many speculations. You could even think about its connection to the name Emmett, like Doc Emmett Brown from Back to the Future. And I actually have a bit of a confession here that I have never watched any of Back to the Future movies, so you can stone me for that in the comments. And so because of that, I can't really comment on the deeper meanings of Back to the Future that may have an significance or some sort of importance relevance for One Piece here but I guess off the top of my head and based on what I know about the Back to the Future series it's the idea that if you go back to the past and change one thing that has consequences for the future and I guess knowing what we know about the ancient kingdom being a futuristic city in the past also Vegapunk being a crazy genius scientist similar to how Doc Brown is in the series in the film series I don't know maybe there are some connections there too, you let me know. Now reading chapter 1119, mystery or source of intrigue that I continue to be quite invested in and very interested in is this idea of whether the Iron Giant is actually being activated by the Drums of Liberation. And this chapter actually evoked that same consideration again for me because of that idea and the conversation between Joy Boy and Emmett or the snippet of a conversation that we got to see. So this is something that I actually also discussed in relation to chapter 1118. Essentially, the popular consensus has been that the Iron Giant is activated by the Drums of Liberation and it needs Luffy's Nika heartbeat to come to life and to take action. Almost as if those Drums of Liberation serves like an energy source and it powers the Ancient Giant or the Iron Giant, sorry. Whereas I was considering after the last chapter that maybe that's not how the Iron giant or Emmett works at all. It's not necessarily that the Drums of Liberation powers and activates the Iron Giant, but it's more the sense that the Iron Giant has been conscious but just resting for hundreds of years and it's been waiting for a time to get up and act. And in the case of the current events going on at Egghead, hearing the Drums of Liberation switched on the Iron Giant's attention and Emmett realized, okay, now is the time to act. And I'm guessing that something similar happened 200 years ago that caused the Iron Giant to attack Marijoie. I'm guessing something to do with the developments concerning the Fishmen. And then back then, you know, 200 years ago, Emmett realized actually it's not the time and then just decided to go power down and rest again. And I think chapter 1119 may further support my hypothesis because we now know that there is this idea that there is a time that Joy Boy has almost prophesized or at least told Emmett to wait for until he should take action. And so like I was saying, it's as if Emmett and the Iron Giant simply activated himself during the Egghead Island arc because he now realized it was his time to act and it was that time that Joy Boy was speaking about. But of course, this then causes or raises further questions. What is that time? And what made Emmett realize it was now that time? Or what specifically made Emmett realize it was now that time? Because we have seen him wake up and start walking before, but it was only in chapter 1119 that we see Emmett take such active and violent 
violent, almost aggressive action in punching the Gorosei. Previous chapters in the Egghead Island arc, Emmet was seen sort of making a passive or at least an uncertain, unsure decision to take action, it's really in this chapter that he makes a decisive choice to take an almost aggressive stance. So then what is it? What happened? Is it simply Luffy and his drums of liberation? Or does it also have to do with the fact that Bonnie has recently been able to transform into her Nika form? You know, has her transformation somehow fulfilled some sort of condition that Joy Boy has set? You know, is it the idea that Luffy or Nika's ability to inspire others to achieve true and absolute freedom, does that signify the fulfillment of the warrior of liberation's purpose in the world? And then this then for sure showcases that the will of Joy Boy has been revived. I don't know if any of that makes perfect sense, but I think you get my drift. So I guess if you have any thoughts surrounding Emmett and Joy Boy, then please do let me know. I think this has naturally segued us quite nicely to discuss Bonnie's transformation or her continued use of her Nika form in this chapter. So Mars claims that this is just a copy. It seems like he's almost trying to downplay it, just saying it's a cheap replica. It's not the real thing. And I don't know if that's supposed to be a red herring or if that's true. You know, is it really and simply just the powers and abilities of her devil fruit to be able to copy any devil fruit so long as she's able able to imagine an alternate future? In which case, I don't know what's more broken or what's more significant. The fact that she was able to transform into Nika separate to her use of her devil fruit abilities or the fact that she has a super strong devil fruit or super broken ability that lets her transform into essentially anything. It doesn't even need to be a copy of another devil fruit. She could imagine a future where she's an actual giant. She could imagine a future where she is one of the Gorosei. She, she knows of Imu's existence. She could decide that I have Imu's powers. Not that we know what Imu's powers are exactly. I guess it is significant for us to find out because if it does have something to do with Emmett taking action, then I think this means that her Nika form is even more significant than we realize. But if it is just the Devil Fruit ability, then this opens up so many possibilities for future combat which I think is super, super exciting. And again, super, super broken. I guess a limiter to that would be what we saw in this chapter, which is the fact that she can't quite use it or maintain another form as energy intensive or resource intensive as the Nika form, which is unsurprising. Even Luffy, when he first activated Gear 5, wasn't able to maintain it for a very long time. Even now, it's super, super energy draining. So I guess with time, Bonnie's ability and her transformation will also last longer. Now we are moving into the action of chapter 1119, but before we get there, I do think there is one more lore or mystery related aspect that I think we need to discuss and that's Vegapunk's continued transmission message. Okay, so in this chapter, we again just get bits and pieces. It seems like Vegapunk's message might continue unless the Gorosei somehow find a way to really destroy Emmett, which is still a possibility. But okay, so let's go back to this chapter. What does Vegapunk say exactly? Basically, from the end of chapter 1117 to now, he is imparting a message to those who bear the name of the D. And he was saying, within you there is a, or in the unofficial translation it was Mo. And we didn't see all that much dialogue in chapter 1118, but then he's saying, okay, nothing of the sort, nothing or, or nothing dot 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 of the sort. That's why dot dot dot. So I guess ugh, it's a bit hard to piece together, but he's clearly talking about those who have the will of the D and he knows that they've been targeted because of probably just one among them. So I'm guessing it's part of a prophecy. The Gorosei know of a prophecy that in the family or in the clan of the D, one will rise again. There will be one among the D clan. I don't know what the nothing of the sorts is supposed to mean, but I guess it's the will. That's the will that has carried through um, or has carried forth throughout generation. And that's the reason why they've been 
the targets of the world government scorn and now Vegapunk hopes that his message and his what his knowledge of the D family means will reach them. I don't know, I guess still to be continued. I was so sure after the last chapter that we probably weren't going to see more of Vegapunk's message. And now it seems like it's still continuing, but in classic One Piece style, just bits and pieces. So I guess we can move on to the fight team. I love, absolutely love the continuation of that fight fun, quirky, classic cartoon style of fighting. You know, the Looney Tunes vibe, loving it. And I just think it's so perfectly One Piece that one of the first real battles that we're seeing involving the Gorosei, the Gorosei of all people, that fight is being treated in such a funny, goofy way. You know, I just think it's so perfectly outrageous that even the heads of the world are being given this Looney Tunes treatment. And I mean that it's outrageous in a good way. This is something that I can't wait to see animated, especially if it's being animated right with all that Looney Tunes energy. It's been a while since I've watched the Egghead Island arc in their One Piece animation. So if you've been tuning into the anime, let me know how it's turning out. Let me know if it's a good time for me to jump back in and if it's worth me tuning back in. Also clarify something for me here because I'm really rereading the chapter and Walkuri is in water right I guess in one panel it seems like he has jumped off his leapt to reach the boat to go headbutt the boat so I'm guessing maybe he was on land and then has jumped over the water but then because of Emmett's punch he is now in water is he standing in water when he's being punched by Emmett I don't know if that's significant or not I'm just raising it because I guess whether the Gorosei can withstand water or not implies something about the potential devil fruits possessed by the Gorosei, or rather the lack thereof. I guess what I'm trying to say is that if the Gorosei are in water and are able to fight and use their devil fruit form, maybe this actually implies that they're not devil fruit users, that their creature forms are not the results of their devil fruit abilities because they're clearly able to withstand seawater, which we know is obviously the natural weakness or limitation of a devil fruit user like or is it a mistake which you know i tend to find a little less likely or is it supposed to show us that even with devil fruits because they're gorsei the standard rules and the standard limitations that applies to the rest of the world don't apply to the gorsei or is it because walkuri is in water that emmet was able to punch walkuri and take off a chunk of his tusk and actually cause damage and break off that tusk because Walkuri was slightly limited and was slightly restrained or his powers and his strength was weakened by that seawater. Let me know if I'm way overthinking this because apart from that crazy rambling, I do really want to say that this is such a great panel. It's a moment that we have been waiting for for so long ever since we found out about the Iron Giant and about the Gorosei's impending arrival and their involvement in the Egghead Island arc. We have been waiting for the Iron giant to step up and save the straw hats and i know people were disappointed after emmet started drowning and was sent flying by the gorosei but i think this is just a clear sign always have faith in one piece <laughs> you know um i guess in that way have Emmett in One Piece, seeing as Emmett can mean faith. Sometimes you just gotta chill, take a step back, and wait for the story to unfold. And I know that that's hard because I can be also sometimes guilty of it myself. And I guess that's what happens when you're so invested and so passionate about a story. You just get so outraged and so emotional. But, you know, it's a good lesson. Just chill out because it's all gonna work out. <laughs> I guess there was another sort of intriguing aspect about the action sequence. Essentially, who was Luffy talking about when he said that you guys are using Haki? You guys is plural. So he's clearly talking about more than just Sanji. But Sanji is the only one out of the trio who we know for sure can use armament Haki or Haki at all for that matter. And if we go back to that fight scene, it does seem like Bonnie's attack might be coated in armament Haki. There is that darker shading, which I can't say the same for Frankie. So is he referring to all three of them? Is he only talking about Sanji and Bonnie? I don't know, I'm feeling, I guess, somewhat ambivalent about the whole thing. Bonnie having Haki, that makes sense to me. Yes, I know that she is young 
And that is also part of the gripes that people had about her being able to transform into Nika as well. But we also know that she's been training for years. And she's been training since she was very, very young. And that she was already almost naturally gifted in combat. Frankie, him having Haki. Well, I know that his whole point is that he relies on his technology when it comes to combat. But as we enter the final saga, or should I say that now that we are well and truly in the final saga. I think him having Haki is a perfect natural step up in the story as a combatant. And we know that people can imbue Haki into weapons and into objects. So I think Frankie being able to use Haki alongside his cyborg body, I think that's just a natural progression. I guess for some emotional piece, we have to discuss the scene between Kaku and Stussy. Very poignant, very emotional, very full circle. Obviously Kaku and the rest of the CP9 agents were the ones that betrayed Pauly in Water 7. And now Kaku and Luchi and I guess the rest of the Cypher Pole agents are now the... Is betray ye a word? Anyways, they were betrayed. Doesn't feel too good, does it Kaku? I think it is very touching though because we know of the loyalty that exists at least between the Cypher Pole agents. We've known that they have this cute relationship and a very strong bond between the agents themselves, even if they don't necessarily have that with others and they are great at espionage and feel no qualms about betraying others, despite, you know, individuals like Pauly and the other shipwrights feeling they had a really strong friendship. Cypher Pole agents didn't care when they were back in the CP9, but we did see in the cover story that they have a real loyalty with each other. And so we know that Stussy's betrayal must have actually really cut deep for Kaku. You know, he actually would have really felt hurt, like losing a friend. And I think the Egghead Island arc has been really great at humanizing and showing the real relationship between the Cypher Pole agents. We saw it back with Luchi when he was showing concern for Kaku earlier in this arc. Now we see it with Kaku and Stussy. Even Stussy is feeling her, I guess, being conflicted about her loyalty towards Vegapunk versus her loyalty to her friends. And I don't know, I, I am really just loving it. And I know that I haven't discussed the significance of the cover stories in a while, but I think this volume, this story of Yamato, specifically in chapter 1119, is quite a big one. So Yamato is being stoned by the citizens. It looks like the children of Kibi. And I think we do have to remember that Kibi has been absolutely absolutely destroyed because of Kaido and Orochi's developments in the area. You can see it in the cover story as well. It's really desolate, really run down, become this really sad, almost dead factory region. And so I understand why the citizens are acting this way. I also have a feeling that we're going to see Yamato win over the hearts of all the citizens and that Yamato is going to be able to break that cycle of hatred which I know is also something that some people were very concerned about because of Hiyori's dialogue in her final moment with Orochi where basically she seemed to be spreading that prejudice again and she seemed to be sowing those words of hate against the Kurozomi clan again which is partly what caused the entire conflict in Wano in the first place but I think maybe that Yamato is going to be used to showcase reversing that cycle of hatred and reversing that idea of prejudice. And I think this volume of the cover story is a really great but brutal depiction of the ramifications of horrific events like colonialism. Because, I mean, yes, Yamato was one of the good guys, but to the rest of the Wano citizens, and especially those who have suffered a lot under the previous rule, and those who weren't actually present at Onigashima, Yamato is simply Kaido's child. And also at the end of the day, Yamato clearly looks very different, has a very different appearance versus the rest of the Wano citizens, is clearly an outsider, and I think this also permeates a lot of people's worldviews and I guess their treatment towards those who are others. Because even despite the fact that Yamato is clearly a good friend of the Shoguns, is a close confidant of Momonosuke, and I'm guessing, you know, Yamato must hold some sort of formal position 
would have been heralded as one of the great protectors of Wano. Despite all of that, Yamato is still receiving this sort of brutal treatment. And so I guess this cover story is gonna be a lesson that you really actually have to get to know people, you can't just judge them based on appearance, you can't let prejudice and the cycle of hatred win. Or at least that's what I'm thinking. But I guess, again, like with everything else, I guess we'll see. Anyways, I think that is the bulk of what I had to, or what I wanted to discuss about chapter 1119. I did also enjoy the giants, now the other giants dancing to the drums of liberation. Again, that is a mystery. The connection between drums and I guess not drums, sorry, the giants. Giants, Joy Boy, and the Ancient Kingdom is something I can't wait to figure out. And I guess if you have thoughts about any of this, then please do let me know because we are now entering a break week and I would love to continue discussing our favorite series together. Anyways, that's it from me. Thank you for listening to some of my crazy, crazy ramblings. I hope you were able to follow through all of that. Please support the channel by liking this video, sharing this video. Please do subscribe. You can also become a Patreon or channel member and thank you to our current patrons and channel members for all your ongoing support. This is Drew Girl and I'll see you again soon.